Well, hello together. Today's topic is uh, cloud native deployments into Azure with the help of Porter. So uh, welcome to this webinar. On my side is uh, Thorsten Hans. He's our cloud native expert. My name is Göran Homberg, and uh, we will uh, share some, some knowledge with you during the next about, I think, 50 to 60 minutes. Let's, let's see how fast we can get through. Yeah. Um, before I hand over to Thorsten, I would share some uh, basic knowledge about the, the, the big marker platform you're using today with us. Uh, so just let me share some slides with you. Um, first of all, uh, to the right side, you've got the possibility to use the chat. Uh, so please uh, let us in, leave us in a hello there or uh, yeah, a greeting from where you are attending. Um, to, the, to the right of the chat, there's a Q&A section. Uh, this can be used to drop some questions. We uh, would take uh, a look afterwards uh, after Torsten has uh, finished his talk. And um, well, you can leave an, an upvote there if somebody has uh, the same question uh, as you have. So give him an, an upvote so we get a priority when we look into the Q&A. Um, yes, <laughs> I already shared that with you. So we can skip that. Um, if you've got uh, more detailed questions or you want to look into some code with uh, Torsten, um, please feel free to register for uh, a free uh, expert one-on-one -on -one with him. I will show you the registration link with you just in a second. And uh, well, you can register yourself. I will reach out to you uh, to make sure that you get the, the most suitable slot for you. And then you can uh, go head to head with Torsten. Uh, about your question. At the end of the um, webinar, we would kindly ask you uh, for some feedback. And if you have to leave uh, earlier, please uh, make use of the um, drop down menu in the upper right and uh, leave exit webinar. If you're do, uh, doing so, um, you will be forwarded to our uh, feedback website. And uh, well, just leave us uh, your feedback there and uh, maybe you can. Uh, give us a hint uh, what uh, topic would be an in interest for you. So we can uh, take a look at that maybe in the next webinar or one of the next webinars during the next month. Um, if you leave not over the, uh, during the, the webinar and uh, you stay with us till the end, you will be forwarded to the feedback site uh, automatically. Well, as that's all from my side for now. I will join later. So Torsten, the stage is yours. Uh, rock and roll, have fun. See you later. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Geron, for having me, and thanks to all of you for joining uh, here to this webinar. So let's right, jump right into um, the topic by sharing uh, my slide deck. So obviously, quickly, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Thorsten. I work as a consultant with Think Texture for quite uh, some time right now. I think it's six years and still counting. Um, my main technology focus is uh, cloud native, um, especially in, in Microsoft Azure. Um, I have uh, a favor for containers and Kubernetes. And I also do a bunch of infrastructure as code things. So I deal with tools like Terraform, uh, Project Bicep from the Microsoft side, which is a, a newcomer in that area. Uh, on my blog and on our company blog, I yeah frequently publish posts about all those topics. And if you have any kind of question, don't hesitate, just reach out via mail or via Twitter. Um, yeah, as soon I I come back to you as soon as as it's possible. All right, so what we will cover today. Um, so basically, the entire webinar is about deploying a cloud native application that consists of several parts, right? So we have obviously some kind of cloud infrastructure, which is in our case, a um, uh, managed Kubernetes cluster in Azure. And um, Along that side, we need some assistance, uh, some assistant services like a storage account, for example. And once the infrastructure is up and running, uh, we ensure that certain application dependencies are deployed into the cluster. And last but not least, we deploy um, the actual application using a Helm chart into the previously provisioned 
Kubernetes cluster. So that's the idea. That's why we are here. Um, but it's not an, an webinar where we, you know, uh, go through um, through things like, uh, let's say, GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps. Um, I want to introduce you to a fairly um, different approach how to uh, deploy or how to provision cloud native applications. So if you think about um, provisioning or deploying cloud native or cloud based applications, then we have, as already said, a bunch of artifacts, right? We have obviously the infrastructure, we have our application binaries that may be uh, a container or some container images that may be just a binary that may be in serverless function if you are using Azure functions, for example, or AWS Lambda. We have some kind of uh, related services or downstream services that our actual application relies on. So for example, uh, consider you know you build a, a web API that pulls some data from a database and exposes it via HTTP. Then obviously the database is a kind of related or downstream or dependency service to our actual application. Last but not least, we have uh, we always have to deal with some kind of configuration data that may be um, sensitive data like the connection string, like passwords, like certificates, or we also talk about non-sensitive configuration data. Best example uh, would be, for example, the um, the log level. So how um, um, in which detail logs will be pushed to an external logging system or to a log file. Um, yeah, and if you if you think about all of that, then um, although all those counterparts seem fairly easy to a to a seasoned developer, the entire tool chain is rather complex, right? We use a bunch of tools to actually make that happen, and if we take a look at the workflow, what happens? Um, that's a workflow that you may typically see in your CI CD pipeline, right? So there is, obviously we build and execute the unit tests for our application component. Then we build the application. Maybe we build some kind of Docker image and we publish it to a container registry. That's totally optional, but it may be part of the, the entire workflow. Then we spin up the cloud infrastructure where our application should all um, finally be pro being provisioned to. Sometimes we have to configure uh, the, infra the infrastructure once it's provisioned. Not all infrastructure services are able to be uh, configured upfront in the way we want them to be. So maybe we have to revisit um, a previously provisioned system again and do some tinkering or um, further customizations based on the service that has been provisioned. Then we have to deploy um, the dependencies. So for example, the bring in the database schema for the SQL database, where our API should pull data from. And last but not least, we can deploy the application into the environment. And speaking about deploying applications, um, we have prepared a quick poll. So Geron, can you shoot in the poll? Um, because I want to, to know how do you bring your application artifacts or your applications into an environment, let's say development or production today. So either manually, semi-manually, using continuous deployment, or perhaps uh, you're leveraging um, a thing called GitOps. So please uh, give us a give us a vote in the poll, and we will revisit that one later during the webinar. Okay, so if we take it to a technical level and think about deploying a cloud native application, a bunch of tools may be involved, and those tools, you know, they. Um, they differ from project to project, from application to application, from team to team, even from team member to team member, right? For example, I personally, I prefer using Bash to do my scripting. Colleagues of mine, they prefer to use PowerShell. I know other developers that are still, uh, that, yeah, that are kind of uh, amazing 
uh, or it's a kind of amazing how fast they are and spinning up regular plain old batch files that we all know from um, the early Windows ages. And then we have a bunch of tools that are related to the actual programming language we use to solve a problem, right? If you use, uh, if you build your web API, let's say with .NET, then you use the .NET CLI. If you are on the Node.js um, side, then you use NVM and NPM to deal with um, the programming lang language specifica. Then we have some cloud CLI, right? For example, AZ as the Azure CLI, AZ copy as an additional CLI to, you know, interact with uh, Azure storage accounts. When we think about infrastructure, we have Terraform and Terraform version manager, TFN, for example, or the new kid on the block, uh, Bicep, Project Bicep from Microsoft also comes with a uh, with dedicated CLI. Uh, to be honest, it's it has two faces, right? You can use Bicep from within Azure CLI, but it also offers a dedicated CLI. Um, and if you're in on in on the container side, then you are at least using things like Docker or the alternatives to build images. You're using kubectl to, to interact with your Kubernetes cluster. And if you're using Kubernetes, ch chances are good that you are using Helm as the package manager. So you end up in using Helm CLI on top of that. And you know, just having all of those um, CLIs, it's, it's not that you have to learn all the commands and flags often they differ in the kind how they are structured and they differ in the kind how arguments or flags are has to be specified, right? Is it dash dash P to uh, specify a port forwarding? Is it dash P? Was it dash N for name? Is it dash dash N for name? Who knows? I mean, in the end, it really depends on the tool and that brings a certain level of complexity to the table that has to be solved. And let me quickly, yeah, that's it. And that's um, that's one of the, yeah, you know, the pain points. I mean, every one of us is able to work in his tool set and use the CLIs he's used or she's used to use every day. But think about the, the guy who has to install or has to integrate your application your, in, in his environment, on her environment, right? He or she may not be familiar with Terraform CLI, or he or she may not be familiar with latest and greatest Helm CLI. And to make things even worse, think about all the different versions. Maybe the developer was using Azure CLI in version 2. something, 2.5, let's say, and the guy who's responsible for installing everything, he, he only has Azure CLI 2.2 installed. So there's also that clash on that level that also if you're familiar with a tool, you have to ensure that a certain version level is existing on every you know machine or every user has access to the same version. So in the end, it's it is harder than it actually looks in the first place. But thankfully there is hope there's some uh, light at the end of the tunnel, right? So there is a thing called CNAP. And CNAP brings us to the next uh, section. CNAP is a um, specification. It's actually the specification that, um, that defines how cloud native or distributed applications, let's say it that way, are not only installed, it also specifies how they are packaged and how such a cloud native application can be mutated or can be destroyed if you you know think about a development environment that you just spin up to run some unit tests and then you want to tear it down. Um, so you have to ensure somehow that all the artifacts and services will be deprovisioned um, in order to you know be, be have a clean plate again. So CNAP specifies exactly those things: how those apps will be dis distributed, how they are packaged and what happens or what happens if the app gets installed, upgraded or uninstalled. On top of that, CNAP is cloud agnostic. So although CNAP and the implementation that we will look at in a few minutes 
they are heavily you know um pushed or yeah let's say um certain companies drive bigger investments in that area however the idea is to be cloud agnostic and the CNAP spec is there to enforce that so every tool that implements the spec has to be some has to be cloud agnostic and if we end up with having a thing let's say a bundle that is CNAP compliant um, then we can or we know that this thing is easy to share easy to consume we can sign it to ensure uh, a, a certain level of integrity right so the actual me as the bundle publisher and the consumer you know we can look at a at the hash and we can ensure that the bundle was not modified uh during transport from the trusted location to the place where it should be installed so what is a CNAP bundle? If we look into a CNAP bundle, we have we have three things. We have application images with so-called invocation image, and we have a bundle descriptor. So let's look into those um, one after another. So application images, typically we can, um, or let's say that by CNAP uh, plays well with uh, container containerized applications. So we can, package our application images into a CNAP bundle, which allows us to install software that relies on container in images in an air gap scenario, right? So if the cluster or if the, the guy who's responsible for installing the application, let's say to a Kubernetes cluster, um, he has the bundle on his machine. He has a direct connection to the Kubernetes cluster. He's able to install that without having a connection to, let's say, a trusted uh, container registry because you can bake those images into the CNAP bundle. That said, it's totally optional. So you can use Porter and CNAP without you know, running in containers. It plays well together, but it's not a must-have. So if you want to, you can package your application images into your CNAP bundle. That's the one thing, that are application images. Second thing is the invocation image. Technically, um, technically it's a container image um, that is responsible for bringing all the tools, you remember all those different tools, in all the required versions and execute uh, or invoke them in the order you define the workload. So for example, if you say during installation, use Azure CLI to spin up AKS and then use um, kubectl to deploy certain bits, then the, those, um, then th this workflow um, is specified in a YAML file and the invocation image is responsible for actually executing those uh, steps in the order you specified it. On top of that, um, the invocation image obviously um, contains a bunch of metadata, right? So configuration values will be attached or baked into that invocation image. But in the end, that's actually the installer. And to, to take it one step further, it's think of it as the MSI or the Nullsoft installer for the cloud. Everyone knows Nullsoft installer, if I remember correctly, uh, that was the one that Winamp uses back in those days, right? Um, so the invocation image, that's actually the component that is responsible for talking to the cloud infrastructures, no matter if it's public or private cloud, and to bring your app alive. And that's exactly what we want, right? We want to simplify the process of bringing a piece of software with all its dependencies, with all its infrastructure, to a certain environment. The last part of a CNAP bundle is the bundle descriptor. Bundle descriptor is a JSON document that again holds some um, basic information about the bundle itself, like name, description, and it holds um, information about the inputs, so data that I can provide upon installing a bundle, and outputs on the other hand side if you deploy an application, let's say, to an Azure app service, uh, and potential output could be uh, the, the full qualified domain name where users can access that app. 
And this the bundle descriptor can also be signed. So just to have that on the list. CNAP, I already said CNAP uh, makes some assumptions or spe uh, specifies how CNAP bundles uh, should or could be um, distributed. Good thing every CNAP bundle is an OCI compliant artifact, which means in the end you can push it or consume it from any container registry that Im implements the Docker registry 2.0 standard. So for example, you could use Docker, uh, the, the regular Docker registry. So they have, they also have a private offering that you can uh, rent on a monthly basis, or you can, for example, use Azure Container Registry as your distribution channel. So you can hand over credentials to your customers. If you think about the ISV scenario, right? You build an app and you have a bunch of customers that want to consume that. Um, then you can, you can hand them over some authentication information. They can log in into Azure Container Registry and then they can pull the CNAP bundle from ACR and they can ensure that it's, um, yeah, that it, that it comes from a trusted source. Okay, so why should you use that? I mean, that adds another layer of complexity, right? Um, first of all, um, things have has to become easier, right? We're using like 15 different CLIs to get things done and everything tries to simplify something. But in, in the end, yeah, somehow you made your way, you learned the CLIs, but that doesn't count if the, if your coworker next to you is not able to use one of them. So um, the idea is to take a look at one implementation of, of CNAP in, in a second that can solve that. So we can still use our tools and our know-how that we know and love. Um, but if we distribute the application, we want to keep things as simple as possible. So in the end, it's abstracting away the complexity. Um, yeah, perhaps there's the one guy who's uh, a champ in actually deploying all your cloud native workloads. But what happens if that champ is not available, let's say for three weeks because he's in vacation? So you can uh, eliminate or get rid of that truck factor and you know share the knowledge by just saying, hey, to install that bundle or to install the application, you just have to invoke one comment. And probably you have to provide some credentials and some configuration values, but that's it. It doesn't matter what happens behind the scenes. And by signing the bundles and using things like ACR as distribution channels, right? You can establish trust across the across your company border, right? So if you talk to your customers, you can say, hey, you always get your installation by looking at that uh, at that Docker registry or that registry that implements Docker registry 2.0, and it's secured by, let's say, that authentication me mechanism and transport is always ensured via uh, TLS and stuff like that. So it simplifies, in the end, it simplifies the entire life cycle of um, a cloud native application. We're not talking just about installing, we're talking about um, updating, removing, and the CNAP specification also give, gives us the room to add our own um, commands or let's say workflows to the application life cycle of a cloud native application. Obviously, everything becomes version controlled. I mean, a couple of years ago, we have that uh, raise of uh, infrastructure as code, and right now it spreads even even farther, right? We have GitOps um, addressing how deployments may look like in a Kubernetes cluster. And with Porter, we can put the entire workflow, including infrastructure as code, including dependencies, including distributing application binaries into a Git repo, and we have it version controlled. And obviously, as already mentioned, for the guy who is responsible for actually using it, so your potential customer, it's an atomic action, right? At some point, he's a, he says, install that bundle, go for it. Okay, so let's come to the meat. Um, there is Porter. Porter is an open source project that is actually an and full-fledged implementation of the CNAP uh, specification. 
Porter addresses um, everything that I, I mentioned previously in, um, in when talking about CNAP. Uh, but on top of that, Porter tries to solve common tasks that we we were all facing for years, right? For example, let's talk about credentials. Everyone knows it. Uh, you go to random developers terminal and you look through the bash history, and I bet you will find a bunch of credentials that were ex accidentally not removed from the bash history, right? So Porter has a solution for that, a, a similar solution for um, for parameters. So how can you bring configuration data into that process and make make it, let's say, accessible, right, for the user? So make it easy to specify uh, those parameters. You have a guide like a wizard, you know, that guides you through specifying all the required or all the all the parameters. We have. Um, outputs also already talked about that, like the uh, full qualified domain name from an Azure app service, but also inside of the workflow. You know, we will look at spinning up a Kubernetes cluster, and right after the, the Kubernetes cluster is there, we need to get access to it. So we can hand over data between steps, no matter which tools are used in steps. You will see it in a minute. Last but not least, there are mixins, and mixins um, is a great way to address that cloud agnosticity, right? So we have, for example, Azure CLI, so that brings a certain tool that I can use in my invocation image, and there is an AZ mixin for Porter um, that adds this functionality. There's also an AWS CLI, and so there's an AWS mixin. So it makes sense you can think of that as small pieces of functionality that you can bring in into your workflows. Yeah, and obviously Porter is exactly that CLI that you use. That's a single CLI that your customers can use to author and to use um, CNET bundles. So we have the Porter manifest. That's a sort of center of gravity, let's say it in that way. Uh, that's a manifest where you describe everything, right? You describe how an install like a workflow looks like, how upgrading looks like, which parameters you have, which credentials you have. And based on that uh, manifest, Porter creates a CNET bundle for you. And um, all the tools, as said, those mixins will be added to um, the invocation image. So Docker takes care about, you know, creating the Docker file for that invocation image. So you don't, you can bring your own template for the Docker, uh, for the Docker file, but you don't have to write a Docker file on your own. Yeah, Porter Mixins already talked about that. There are a bunch of mixins that are, um, that are maintained by the contributors of Porter, uh, like for example, AZ, AWS, Google Cloud, um, then the Terraform um, mixin, the Kubernetes mixin, but there are also community driven um, mixins already appearing. There is the Helm 3, if I remember correctly, is, uh, is an, a thing, is a, is a mix-in that has been founded um, outside of the, the Porter organization and is now, you know, uh, used almost everywhere. And for compatibility reasons, there's also a Helm 2, uh, a Helm 2 mix-in, and we see more and more mix-ins appearing. The exact mixin, so that's the like the last resource, right? If there's no mixin that describes or that interacts with the thing that you want to automate, then you can use exec to you know exec or to invoke shell scripts or functions in shell scripts. From um, yeah, from integration or installation perspective, how does it look like? Well, at some point you hand over a CNAP bundle to the guy who's responsible for installing. Yes, at some point pulled the bundle. It's on his local machine. He has Porter installed, obviously, and he he says um, he has to specify his parameters, his credentials, so his uh, service principal ID, his Azure subscription ID, and so on and so forth. And then he hits Porter install or Porter bundle install and provides those parameter those parameters and credentials. Right. So then the Docker image will be instantiated and the invocation image, um, yeah, takes care about the installation workflow. And that's actually the component that talks to the destination environment and executes all the steps 
you defined. All right, so before we jump into the demo, because I was talking a lot, um, what, 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 were, what were the results of our poll, Goran? Well, um, maybe you expected that, but the uh, majority uh, uses continuous deployment. Yeah, yeah, that was what I was expecting. Yeah. Do, we, do we have any vote for GitOps? Uh, actually, not uh, to be honest. Not okay. Yeah. Um, continuous deployment has about yeah close to ninety percent. Okay. And okay. Uh, we, we get some uh, <laughs> minor votes for uh, deploying manually. So yeah. um, I think these guys are yeah on the right place here. <laughs> yeah. So well, the the question is, uh, or why was I asking which kind or we, or which model do you use to ship your software actually? Uh, because often the question that came uh, that comes up is, what's the benefit? What do I get from adopting Porter? Right. So obviously, if you do it manually, you know that there are certain things to do right now. Right. It's a, uh, you don't have to go all in on Porter at this point. I mean, Porter, um, the good thing is you can use Porter in continuous deployment, right? And again, it unifies the way. I mean, right now, I let's say some someone of the uh, the attendees uh, who voted for GitHub, uh, for, for GitHub's for continuous deployment uh, is using GitHub Actions, right? So there are certain, I think they call it steps, steps that you can consume from trusted vendors, like for example, GitHub itself, from Microsoft, from the Azure team, from the AWS team, you name it. But there are a bunch of uh, steps that come from, you know, one-man shows, from people like, like you and me uh, that use um, their spare time to spin up uh, such a step or an activity that others can use in their automation workflow. So the question is, how reliable is that, right? What happens if I pull my GitHub action that I or activity that I published into the marketplace? And do you, are you hundred percent sure what happens inside of that, inside of that uh, step? So imagine you know having everything described in a bundle. The bundle is part of your um, of your repo. Then you just have to download Porter. Porter is written in Go, so that makes it easy to distribute and it runs on all popular operating systems. So you can easily download the executable and invoke it right from your CI CD pipeline. And if you, for example, think about not just the public cloud, if you think about you know, continuous deployment in a scenario where you have to or you could address the majority of your customers using the public cloud offering, but there's the one customer who wants to run the application in his data center, then you can address that with the Porter bundle, right? You can you can bring in all the application images and you can hand, hand the, the bundle over to your new customer and say, okay, you, that's fine. You just have to install Porter and uh, Docker, obviously, on that machine. And then you can take that uh, good old USB stick, plug it in, uh, copy the bundle or use the bundle from there without having a network or public an internet connection at all, right? So Porter also has a place, I would say, in continuous deployment and um, in, if, if you're doing it manually right now, it may help you, you know, automating all those uh, steps. All right, so demo time. Let's jump into um, Whittle Studio Code. So I have um, over there, I have a sample repository. There is a, you know, and quickly check the clock. Okay, good. Um, there is a .NET Core or .NET Web API. So file new Web API, nothing special here, right? You can check the program CS, just you know all the default configuration. Let's have a look at the starter. Um, so I made one, um, or, yeah, two or three small modifications. I added health checks because that's kind of mandatory if you're running uh, containerized in Kubernetes. So there is the health check endpoint for readiness and liveness. That, that's one that's different to the file new project experience. And I disabled HTTPS redirection because in a containerized environment, 
it's not in the responsibility of the application developer to, you know, make assumptions about where traffic comes in and where should it, because that's handled uh, on the infrastructure layer outside of the application. So that's fairly, you know, file new project experience. I added a sample controller, which has just two, um, two routes, right? We can, you see my great in-memory database to keep things simple right here, right? So we have a bunch of products with prices and there's a get route that we can access to get all the products ordered by name. And we have a get by ID that we can call into provide a good and get, if it is, uh, if it exists, we get a 200 with all the details about the product. If it doesn't exist, we get a 404 back. So that's the demo application that I want to uh, deploy containerized into AKS. For containerization, I take the, um, yeah, pretty much a standard multi-stage Docker file that's used to build a .NET Core or .NET um, applications. Um, one note uh, here, I'm running as a non-root user. So I'm adding a user on the fly um, changing or setting him as the owner for the, the app folder, impersonate into that user. And then I restore the dependencies for the .NET application. We build the app, we uh, publish the app, and we take the release, the publish, also the binaries, uh, copy them over to the final image and invoke .NET with the name of the assembly. So um, the web API should spin up. So that's the simple application. Then we have some scripts here that's just for local development, right? That I can easily spin up or build a Docker image and I don't have to repeat myself that much. But then I have a bundles folder. And a bundles folder, that's where the action takes place. And you see some of, yeah, if you're in the container space, you see charts, okay, so that may be a Helm chart in that folder. Kubernetes, I bet there are Kubernetes manifests in that folder, okay. Terraform, so infrastructure as code belongs to Terraform folder. And there is the Porter YAML. Before pulling up that Porter YAML, I want to go one step back. I want to go to, to CLI. So I have installed Porter on my machine. And let's say, let's make a Hello World. Let's go to Hello World. So I can just invoke Porter Hello, uh, Porter Create, sorry. Um, and let's fire up code in that subfolder right now. So we have a, like, the hello world for for Porter, right? So we have a Porter YAML, and I said that it's the center of gravity in Porter, right? So we have a bunch of metadata there that we can specify over here. So name, version, description, which uh, registry uh, that is used for this dist distribution channel. And then we specify mixins. So what tools do I want to use when it comes to installation, upgrading, removal? In this case, we're just using Axel which means I can invoke shell scripts or parts of a shell script. So the skeleton actually gives you a helpers.sh file, so a shell script over here. And as you can see, we say upon installation, execute that shell script and as an argument, uh, provide install. So let's revisit the, the helper script. And we see there's a corresponding function called install. And at the end of the, um, the shell script, we call the function that's mentioned as the argument or that's uh, yeah, provided as the argument. So my bet, if we run, if we install the application, it will print hello world. If we upgrade it, it will print world two. And if we uninstall it, it will print goodbye. So let's go again to, to the portal YAML. And as you can see, you have to describe every small piece of logic or every step that happens in, in or during installation, during upgrade, during uninstallation. And as I said, you may want to use credentials or you may want to use parameters. So let's bring in some parameters. There's a sample over there for you know specifying a MySQL user, which defaults to WordPress but we can override it from the outside. And there's a Docker template. It was already also mentioned in the um, in the slide deck. So Porter gives you this uh, Docker template and you can customize it, but you don't have to. So by default, 
um, there's the Porter mix in token here. And if you build the invocation image, Porter will look at your manifest and it's, uh, it, it recognizes, okay, Tosn is using the exec mix in. And if the mix in specifies dependencies like its CLI, then those required Docker lines are placed at this line when building the actual Docker file. We will see it in a minute. Let's go to CLI again. And let's say um, Porter build. Starting invocation image build. So right now, and it, it goes pretty fast because I did that right before the, the webinar already. Um, so let's go back to code. And let's go to the CNAP folder and let's take a look at the that's the docker file that's actually being generated and as you can see the exit mix in has no build time dependencies mm, okay fairly uninteresting right so what we can do we can bring in another mix in so let's say porter mix in install on oh, there it is terraform <clears throat> so now we have terraform installed um Building the image right now would happen or would res result in the same Docker file because we are not using the Terraform mixin. So at least we have to make it aware of that we are intended to use Terraform. So let's do a porter or a or build again. Take Take a couple of seconds. Okay, there we are missing something because we said we said okay, we want to use Terraform, but there is no Terraform in that bundle yet. So let's add a Terraform project, and let's add the simplest infrastructure ever, which is just uh, outputting hello value equals world, which is a valid Terraform project at that point. And let's build the invocation image again. And although the image is still building, the Docker file should be updated. And as you can see, we are now leveraging Terraform in the version in version 1.0.4, which is which is the specified default version in the portal mixin. So if you need another one, you can pin the version to let's say 1.0.0. .0 .0. And um, to get that installed in the invocation image, we need those Docker file lines. So Porter takes care about, you know, adding all the necessary commands to the Docker file to build a full-fledged invocation image for you. And by the way, as you can see, copy dot, copy everything from the local context. Context is this folder where we see the Docker template, Docker file template, into the bundle here, so into the invocation image which means we not only get Terraform CLI in 1.0.4 in the invocation image, we also get all necessary files. So the Terraform sub project here will also be part of the invocation image. And perhaps you remember, I removed the comments for parameters. So we can specify parameters and let me clean up things. Order uh, params generate. Uh, let's say hello params. I already have them. Um, so I said Porter has like a wizard or wizard wizardy <laughs> experience when it comes to specifying parameters or sensitive values, right? So we say, hey Porter, I want to generate some parameters and please call them hello params. And it looks at the Porter YAML, uh, at the Porter YAML at the at the manifest, and it recognizes, okay, um, there are two. Um, Two parameters declared. Um, interesting. Um, actually, it's one. <laughs> uh, looks like a bug. Um, or oh, I miss. Or oh, I get something wrong right now. Um, but it asked me how I want to or where do I want to uh, pull that information from. So I can read it from a file, from a shell command. You know, read it as a secret from things like Azure Key Vault or HashiCorp Vault, or I can specify it right now as a value, and I can say, okay, the MySQL user should should be Torsten. And that's it. So I end up in having some uh, parameter sets. And I can look at those. Show 
hello params and you can see okay it's a local value it's a it's a it's a specified value and it's uh, torsten as a value and it's used as the mysql user parameter all right so that's uh, a bit of the um, porter experience um, so the bundle has been built but we haven't installed it yet so we can say porter install and uh, just invoke it in that folder and you see okay install hello world if we check back with uh, the porter manifest so that's a description of the step that will be invoked right and then helpers install just prints hello world and as you can see that's uh, the result or that was actually printed by the shell script so fairly easy if it comes to you know getting started but let's go back to a real world example not the hell world so let's pull up the portal manifest and let's go through some things so um this example i'm using the the exec mixin i'm using terraform and Back in those days when we launched that project, right, we tested our infrastructure as code with 0.15.4, the CLI version of uh, Terraform that was available a couple of months ago. In the meantime, they released 1.0.0, but we haven't tested our infrastructure as code stuff against that CLI version. And we we actually see no, no need for that because it works, right? It spins up the desired infrastructure. For Azure CLI and kubectl, uh, the Kubernetes CLI, we are fine. We should be fine with every any version that we find, right? So we're just using the basics from the, those CLIs, and they haven't changed for years. Although it, yeah, may be a pitfall, so it's a good idea to pin the versions. For Helm three, uh, we pin it to uh, version three point six and Helm 3 as a, as a package manager, uh, you know, that has some kind of package sources, like you have it in, in if you know, apt, the, the package manager on uh, Debian-based Linux distributions. So we have to specify a location where Helm can grab packet or charts, how they are called, uh, where, where Helm can find them. Right, and we're using Kubernetes.github.io to pull an ingress controller. Ingress controller is a piece of software that runs inside of your Kubernetes cluster and is responsible for routing incoming requests to certain applications or to counterparts of your application running inside of the cluster. Okay. So we have a bunch of parameters, right? We need an Azure subscription ID that we know to which uh, subscript subscription we should deploy. We have an Azure region. Where should all the resources go to? Terraform, if you if you want to ensure concurrent infrastructure modifications are um, um, are handled securely, then you have to so Terraform has the concept of state management, right? It tracks state in a JSON file and in a concurrent uh, environment where you and or po potentially a coworker is able to modify the infrastructure using Terraform, you have to push that state to a yeah, remote backend. So, and I want to use that. So I have to specify where that should be placed. It's an Azure storage account, so the name of that one and the folder, which is actually called a container in Azure Blob Storage, how that should be named. Obviously, we need some credentials like client ID, um, client secrets. So we, I'm using a service principle as our authentication or for authentication. And this is interesting, right? Uh, you can um, specify credential, not only specify credentials, you can also hide them from certain workflows in your application lifecycle, right? So maybe client ID is only interesting for installing, upgrading, but not for uninstalling. Okay, then you can remove line 39 and the uninstall workflow um, won't get access to the ARM client ID. Okay, with the tenant ID, obviously to, to tell Azure CLI and all the tools um, which Azure tenant it should talk to. So first step when installing is authenticating using the AZ mixin. And as you can see, it's just mimicking the Azure CLI. So AZ and as an argument to the AZ call, we send login and then we send some flags. 
and we you know pull credentials or parameters here in that case just credentials to authenticate once authenticated we have to select subscription so again az account set that's the azure cli command that gets invoked and dash dash subscription is provided and it should you know set the subscription that's specified as a parameter once it's done storage account is provisioned uh, so it's creating the storage account for the infrastructure as code thing let me jump over some of the ac actions and then once we have that storage account we want to use terraform to spin up the infrastructure so in the terraform project we go there, there's a Kubernetes cluster specified. So you can take your existing Terraform and you know use it in, in Porter without any hassle. So that one is next online. So Terraform does his job. It uh, goes there and installs or provisions the AKS cluster in my Azure subscription. Once that's done, my Terraform has some outputs, the AKS name and the AKS resource group. So where is the location? How is it called? That's printed to standard out from Terraform CLI. And Porter allows me to grab those outputs from STD out and hand them or make them available for following commands, following steps, how we call them. So once that's done, we have the name and the resource group we can use Azure CLI to get the credentials to actually access that Kubernetes cluster. So then we will end up with having a .cube folder in inside of the invocation image that we that's automatically or kubectl and Helm pick up the, those connect, connection information automatically to talk to that cluster. So then we use kubectl to bring in the Kubernetes names uh, namespaces. So that's my Kubernetes manifest that should be applied. Once the namespaces are in place, we use Helm to install the Nginx controller, which again, you know, provisions an Azure load balancer, which again brings in a public IP address and it routes the traffic controlled into the cluster. So that everything in place, then my Helm chart. The thing for my small, tiny Hello World uh, products API will be deployed. And that's a chart. And the chart lives at chart API in a version 1.0. 1.0. Uh, so. Um, so the chart consists of a bunch of templates written in Go template lang, but doesn't matter. In the end, uh, we end up having a deployment. In front of the deployment, there's a, there's a load balancer. Uh, Kubernetes called service um, cluster internal um, that routes traffic to the application containers to the pods running, right? And then we have ingress route, ingress rules that um, yeah take or that sit between um, the ingress or on the ingress controller, and the ingress controller uses them to route requests to my cluster internal service, which again hands it over to the pod. All that is, you know, in the, there's a little bit more when, you know, bringing containers to Kubernetes than just Docker run. So basically, chart is also configured using a bunch of variables. But yeah, in the end, it doesn't matter, right? Because um, from the outside, it's just one small step that we have to take. That said, let's go to the terminal and let's say, Go to the bundles folder. So that's the thing where we were just looking at and say porter bundle, um, or we can just say porter install. Porter install dash dash cred, and it's I have to check out our porter webinar. So I have to reference my credentials. I have previously run through porter creds or porter credentials, generate and gave them a name, porter webinar, and the same, and I did the same for parameters. So if I invoke that right now, fingers crossed. Uh, so we see authenticating to Azure over here. I think I have to, uh, yeah, to reduce the, the lock activity a bit. 
And then we saw, OK, it's authenticated because it's, select, it's selecting desired Azure subscription. Then it's creating the resource group for infrastructure as code, so for the Terraform script, right? Terraform uses that at the state beggar. Right now, it's creating the storage account. And I have already opened the Azure portal. Azure portal does a good job in caching things. So right now, I have over talked like 15 seconds. Let, let's hit refresh. Oh, that was great. Good. Um, so we see actually the resource group appearing over here. And if we go into the resource group, so the storage account is still on its way. And I'm deploying to Germany, West Central region in Azure. Uh, so it's yeah a day to day, a, a, depending on the day form, how fast things uh, spin up. Normally, storage account, uh, there we go, should be up and running quickly. And if we go into the storage account and into containers, we see there's the portal webinar state. So this is the container where the Terraform state will be persisted once Terraform picks up. And as you can see, it's already doing so. So right now, we are saying, OK, in, um, provisioning Azure Kubernetes service. And that's using Terraform. So the Terraform project has to be initialized. Terraform downloads the pinned version for the Azure ARM provider. And right now, it's what Terraform does right now is it executes the Terraform plan. Terraform plan looks at the desired cloud infrastructure or cloud environment and tries to identify what has to be done that the current state in the cloud matches the desired state that I described in Terraform. And the Terraform execution plan, that's what we see right here. You always read, read that from top, uh, from bottom to top, sorry. So it has to spin up a resource group. And once the resource group's done, it has to spin up an AKS cluster. That said, there's a small think time over here, and I actually don't know why. But in a couple of seconds, Terraform should start, you know, writing to the standard out that it's still creating the AKS cluster. But let's again bring in Azure Portal, go to resource groups, hit refresh. It hasn't started yet. Ah, oh, right now. Okay, there we go. So it's starting with creating the resource group. Okay, resource group is here. That's uh, That has finished 10 seconds. And now um, we have to wait, let's say, two minutes <laughs> until the AKS cluster is, um, is being proven. Let's try once again. There we go. So we have the resource group. We should maybe we see the Kubernetes cluster in a second or two. Um, but it's still in in state of creating. But bottom line, what Porter gives you, it gives you exactly this, right? At some point, the deployment will be finished. So we can go to the Azure portal or to the cloud uh, management interface of your choice and take a look at everything that's required to run our service. And in the case of Kubernetes, I mean, it's still in, in uh, status creating. So once that's created, and all my Helm charts and stuff are deployed, we can dive into the cluster from the outside, right? So we will end up seeing our API running as workload over here. We can grab the public IP address and we can just access our application. And that's the idea. You know, it's it was just that invocation of Porter install previously running once through Porter params create or generate and running once through Porter credentials generate. Then we bring in our information, we get the bundle, and we just invoke Porter install. And we will end up with having everything that we need to know, uh, that we need to have to run our service. So let's quickly check again the state of the Kubernetes cluster. Let's look at the yeah, 150. Normally, it takes two minutes and 10 seconds for the, for the small sized Kubernetes cluster here in, in, in Germany West Central. OK, go on. Maybe while we're waiting for Azure to provision the Kubernetes cluster, was there a question already that we can answer right now? 
yes, I got a question um, from uh, Jonas. Okay. Um, he's asking, uh, just read it out. Um, yeah. If sure. you use pure ARM bicep definitions instead of Terraform, can we also embed this in Porter by calling the ACCLI command for deployment? Yes, obviously. So the question, actually a good question. So it's not, uh, Porter does not make any kind of a assumption about the tools you're using. Um, when it comes to bicep, I mean, bicep, um, yeah, works a little bit different like, um, like Kubernetes, uh, like Terraform does. I mean, the good thing is you don't have a state file, right? So you put, Basically, just throw your bicep file into the folder and you use a AZ deployment group create dash n for the name and reference the file. And um, then you get bicep being deployed to Azure in the scope of a resource group in that case. Um, that works. And I think there's a what if uh, switch that you can provide with uh, AZ deployment create um, that will give you a kind of execution plan again, like we, we saw that in Terraform. So that's interchangeable, right? Um, Porter does not make any assumption. I don't know, or actually I'm not sure if there is a mix in for the dedicated bicep CLI yet. But in the end, you can just, you know, invoke as a step, you can invoke AZ bicep install which will then again install the bicep CLI in your invocation image. But right now it's just mimicking, right, the uh, the commands. So yeah, long answer short, yes. <laughs> okay, um, if we have other questions going, we can take them in a minute or two, because in the meantime, uh, we saw that the Kubernetes cluster was provisioned successfully and Porta goes further down in our workflow and it's downloading the Kubernetes credentials that's done. It's had a, it has created two Kubernetes namespaces as we get the confirmation over here. And right now it's installing the Nginx ingress controller. And I don't know if I hit pause right now, that happens some time to me. Okay, so it has right now, that's the default confirmation from the ingress controller when you install that one using Helm. Right now, you see it's installing my API chart and execution completed successfully. There we go. So let's refresh that one. Let's go to namespaces. We see that we have API and default workloads. We see that Porter ABI, okay, zero from two. Hmm. What's happening over here? Let's say AZ AKS uh, get get credentials, easy AKS get credentials. So I know act basically the uh, containers have not yet responded to the readiness probe. So we can check that by saying, hey, kubectl, uh, give me all the ports in the API namespace. And in the meantime, I was typing so slow, they are both and ready, and now everything should be green over here in um, Azure Portal 2. And if we go to services, we see there's the internal service cluster IP that's internally available in the cluster, and the ingress, the Nginx ingress, that has a public IP address. So we can click over here, and we get a 404, which is correct because we are not responding to the root route. So we can, if I remember correctly, it was health slash readiness. Yeah, and we get a healthy bag. And if we go to products, 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 then we should get some JSON back. So that's it. That was one step, one invocation, right, to bring everything alive in. Yeah, everything talking about, you know, infrastructure, about platform or Kubernetes as a service, let's say that way, and everything that has to find its way into the cluster to get my app up and running. And with that, let me jump back to the slides. And let's say, <laughs> thank you for joining uh, from my side. If you have any question, don't hesitate. Shoot me a tweet or shoot me a mail. Um, or use the chance with the expert one-on-one, as Goran um, mentioned during the introduction, 
that's for me one one of the things that I miss most from being in person at a conference is the possibility to chat with uh, folks right after sessions like these. And with that, I hand over back to Guran. Uh, thank you for joining. And we have questions. Um. First of all, uh, Tosin, please let me say that I um, closely fell in love with Potter, <laughs> but I don't uh, should talk that uh, tell that to my wife. Uh, <laughs> few, uh, yeah, a couple of years ago, I had to work with uh, Install Shield, um, and uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> gone through that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's why I lost my hair. Um, so Potter looks really, really sweet. I really yeah. love that. Um, well, um, we got some um, registrations for the expert one-on-one, -on -one, cool. and I recognize that some uh, attendees are uh, had the chance to oh, or had to uh, join later. Uh, mm -hmm. So just give me a second so I can shoot in the, the registration again. Here we go. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, well, I think the the other questions will come up in the expert one on ones. Yeah. So uh, for everybody who's uh, who made a registration, I will reach out for you during yeah, I think tomorrow or yeah Monday, so we can get us a nice slot for you. And uh, well, that's that's all from our side because we don't have any questions anymore. Um, okay. You answered the the question of Jonas, so. Uh, Yes, thank you from my side. Thanks for the show, Thorsten, and sharing your knowledge about Porter. Yeah, great stuff. <laughs> Thanks for having me. was was a pleasure. Okay, so see you next time, and uh, have a great day, and uh, hopefully a great start into the weekend tomorrow. See you. Okay, bye. <laughs>